important uh, thing to analyze in adult deformity. And that is certainly true, but how do you do it? I'm going to try to, uh, to give my views on how to do it in 12 minutes. It's kind of a complicated area. I try to simplify it because this has been talked about for 10 years by particularly French uh, 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 spine surgeons. It is not as complicated as uh, the French often make it, I think. Uh, <laughs> this, uh, this is how they look. They lean forward like this and they are painful. Life like this is painful. I think a key understanding uh, to this issue is the compensation thing. And to understand that any kyphotic deformity in the spine leads to the necessity of compensation. And you can either do this in the spine or you can do it in the pelvis. Spine or pelvic compensation is the key thing to understand. And this is true for DNF scoliosis. And as I claimed in my previous presentation, Think of it as kyphosis, because it is. If you think about scoliosis, scoliosis is, all, is a rotational deformity. And if you have a degenerative scoliosis, and it's always in the tracolumbar or lumbar spine, always. It's never in the uh, thoracic spine. And if you have a rotation of the tracolumbar or lumbar spine, it rotates from the sagittal plane You lose lordosis because of this rotation. It means automatically kyphosis. So it's always, to some degree, kyphosis. Sometimes slight, sometimes a lot. And what does the patient have to do when they go into kyphosis? Any kyphosis. Compensate. They have to compensate. They have to compensate somewhere above, below, or in the, in the hip joints by pelvic retroversion. When you understand this, the whole thing becomes simple. In fact, there are three types, basic type of, spi of sagittal spinal pelvic alignments. The normal thing, which is uh, pretty un unusual, it's compensated in balance, uh, which is, uh, sorry about this, can we go back? Can you go back a couple of slides? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's the compensated imbalance, which is the, the it's the typical one, in fact. It's the, 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 the pa typical patient, the non-compensated imbalance. That's the one, like the lady you saw in the picture. It's very easy. You don't have to be Einstein to understand that she's in sagittal imbalance. But the compensated imbalance, you have to be close to Einstein. <laughs> I have to learn how to identify this patient. We already talked about this, the Glassman study, American study showing the importance of it, it's well known. And uh, what about the uh, C7 plumb line and, and Oswestry scores? Are they correlated? Yeah, they are correlated, but it's not that great really. It's 0.52 in one study, uh, US study, and 0.48 in another one, but they, yes, they are correlated. And uh, I'm going to talk on why not the correlation is not stronger in a, in a little bit. You, c you can have this sagittal balance measured in uh, in a number of ways. Uh, you can have the to the uh, to the left. You have the C7 plumb line, which is the most common one. And in fact, I think that's for me the best one. It's very easy. You don't have to see the hip joint. In fact, uh, or you can use the T1 spinal pelvic inclination theoretically a little bit better. But in fact, it does not correlate better to the ODI than the, uh, than the uh, uh, C7 plumb line, 0.52. So from practical purposes, the C7 plumb line can be used uh, perfectly well. And what is the C7 plumb line? It's here. You can all see it here. It's the red thing here. You take the tip from C7, not, not always so easy to see. Draw the vertical down. And if it's less than five centimeters in front of the uh, posterior corner of, of S1, it's called balanced. Uh, it's not really the whole truth. Uh, and I will show you, this is not sufficient for an adequate analysis of sagittal balance. 
this case is obvious. From an uh, analytical point of view, it's, uh, you know, anybody could say that these patients is in sagittal imbalance. Uh, C7 plumb line way in f up in front. You can you don't you just have to look at the patients. You don't really need any measurements. But what about this patient? Is this patient balanced? The C7 plumb line uh, goes directly to the posterior corner of the of the sacrum. But I claim that she's not balanced. She has a spinopelvic malalignment that is obvious. Talked about a little bit about this before. You see the typical toracolumbar kyphosis, a flattening, in fact, of thoracic spine, lumbosacral hyperlordosis, in fact. Uh, already talked about this. Already talked about this. And how do you compensate? You compensate by thoracic hypokyphosis. You compensate by lumbosacral hyperlordosis, and you compensate by pelvic retroversion, which is maybe a little bit difficult for, for uh, some uh, people to understand. I, I, I try to explain it to you in simple terms. Uh, the most typical case for pelvic retroversion is, as any orthopedic surgeon knows this, in high-grade spondylolisthesis. This is a, a case of high-grade uh, spondylolisthesis, uh, severe slippage. And we all know these patients with a vertical sacrum. This is textbook type of orthopedic surgery uh, uh, on spondylolisthesis. They have a vertical sacrum. And why do they have a vertical sacrum? Yeah, because they have to compensate. Uh, they must compensate. If they don't, they're going to be tipped all over, fall forward. And they compensate by a retroversion of the pelvis. Like in this patient's operated uh, by me, we have uh, some reduction, some fusion, uh, fusion of the L4. And you can see that the retroversion, the version of the sacrum becomes normalized. The patient doesn't have to tilt her pelvis any longer. Uh, this is shown in this picture. Where does the pelvic incidence come into play? Because the pelvic incidence is the key to this discussion, whether the patient compensates with her pelvis or not. The pelvic incidence is the key. Why is the key? because it's a stable angle. It does not change with degenerative things. It does not change with age. It's, it's pretty much stable throughout life. And it's closely correlated, for instance, to the sacred slope, 0.83, in a normal individual. But if uh, uh, the patient goes into spondylolisthesis, or if the patient goes into thoracolumbar kyphosis, or any type of lumbar uh, kyphosis, like a flat back after surgery, the patient starts to compensate by retroversion of the pelvis, uh, as shown on this slide. It's exactly the same pelvis. It's just that the, the, the patient tilts his pelvis around uh, the hip joint. Pelvic incidence is the same, but you see the sacred slope, like here, 45 degrees, goes down to 25. This means that the sacred slope does not correspond to the pelvic incidence. And if you see, you must have standing radiographs of the patients. If you don't have standing radiographs, forget it. You just can't do it. You have to see the hip joint. You have to see the, you have to see the, uh, uh, calculate the pelvic incidence, and you can eyeball it. You don't have to calculate it on the you know, exact number. You can eyeball the pelvic incidence. And you can eyeball the sacred slope. Normally, the sacral slope is 10 degrees less than the pelvic incidence, not more, on average. But if it's, if it's a big discrepancy, let's say the pelvic incidence is 75 degrees and the sacral slope is 25, you know, this is way out of normal. And why? Because the patient retroverts his pelvis, which is painful. It, it takes energy and, and drains the patients of energy, which means pain. So pain not only comes from degenerative discs in this disorder, it comes from the constant demand on the patient to compensate for the deformity. Clinically, you just look for the vertical sacrum. Look for the verticality of the sacrum. If it looks very vertical, look at the pelvic incidence. And if they are disproportionate uh, compensation, C7 plumb line may be completely normal, completely normal, because patient compensates. 
still you have to imp increase the lordosis because patients to relieve the patient for the compensatory uh, uh, demand. Okay, so we have the compensated imbalance. The, the patient stands erect with straight legs, C7 plumb line normal, and you may say this is a balanced pa patient. It may not be. He may have a vertical sacrum. He has a lumbosacral hyperlordosis and thoracic hypokyphosis. He's compensating. You must not fuse this patient into his position he is in. You have to increase the lordosis because if you don't, you actually fix the patient in a kyphotic deformity. And, and actually you make the patient worse. This is why a lot of these patients are made worse by surgery. We all know this. Many of them after a year or two, they come like this. They're okay for the first year because they have the energy to stand erect. But after a while, they go into kyphosis because you failed to understand the basic mechanisms of the spine. Uh, you can do this with the one PSO, like in this case here. Uh, to the left, or you can do it with mul multiple TLFs. I prefer this today. I did this a number of years ago. This, I think, is easier, quicker, and gives better correction. Uh, you can do like uh, Cody Bunger suggested, Smith Peters, and Austin Adamis. Uh, I don't really agree with Cody in this matter. We often disagree for that part. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you get in one SPO 5 to 10 degrees at best, and which is you know way too little if you want to correct you know, like 30, 40 degrees. So yes, you can use it, but don't expect to get too much. Uh, if you want uh, 35 degrees, you do it PSO. It gives on average uh, 35 degrees, and we're not going to talk about techniques uh, today, but it's a great operation put in the rod and bend it down. And the bending of the rod is very important. The way you bend the rod is the way the spine is going to wind up. So you have to bend the rod correctly. Uh, in If you have coronal imbalance, it is much, much less important than the sagittal. In fact, a number of papers have failed to show any impact of coronal balance on the outcome. Cody showed some papers that did show this. So of course, it has some importance, but it's it's very, very much minor compared to the sagittal imbalance. You get away with some coronal imbalance. The patients don't love it. You know, they don't love it, but they tolerate it. But they do not tolerate sagittal imbalance. If it's rotation, you simply put the rod on the convexity, rotate it down like a standard kind of a CD type of maneuver, and you create coronal uh, thing and sagittal thing with uh, in one shot. And you add with some insight of bending and compression of the rods, and that's it. What about complications with the uh, PSO? Yes, there are complications, but the neurological complication rate is not that high, really. I agree to this. We do a lot of PSOs, and uh, we do, you never get complete paralysis. Uh, you do get some typically quadriceps weakness, which is temporary and reversible in something like, I tell the patient, something like 5%. Uh, so I agree with the SRS morbidity report. They claim 7%. Uh, uh, so, of course, it's a major uh, surgery, but very effective one. Uh, compensated sagittal imbalance uh, two types, uh, uh, two patients, or one patient, sorry. Adult idiopathic scoliosis in this case, back pain. And uh, maybe you start to recognize these patients now. Turcolumbar kyphosis, lumbosacral hyperlordosis. The PSO on L1 was done with fusion T5 to L5. L5. And you can see the picture to the right. And this is, this is very typical. You can see a normalization of the sacrum. Uh, it's more horizontal sacrum here than here. You can see actually the lumbar lordosis, the, the, the lumbar sacral lordosis actually decreased, but the upper lordosis, uh, uh, these are the br this is the brace, uh, the uh, oval stuff actually uh, very much increased and actually the thoracic kyphosis increased because no need for compensation any longer so overall spinal alignment uh, uh, normalized am i running out of time one more minute one one minute one more. okay uh, uh, this patient is operated on 1978 by late uh, professor alf nackemson at age 14 
I now work at, at his place, he, and he was operating on the hemivertebra, and he did the fusion L3S1, which was the typical operation at that time, and this is his uh, status right now at age 42, and you can see the vertical sacrum, uh, a typical retroversion of the pelvis, you can even see the, uh, that this is uh, the situation here, uh, and this, he's been this almost all his life in getting used to it. Well, the last, uh, last like 10, 15 years, gradually increasing pain. And if you look at the x-ray, he has a flat back, like many of the patients operating in those days, because we didn't know about the sagittal plane. Scoliosis was a frontal plane disorder, uh, uh, but in adults, it's not. It's a sagittal plane disorder. And uh, he's also in the coronal plane, or slightly decompensated. I did a PSO on L3. Uh, the level above the hemivertebra, did use an anterior cage for support because of uh, took away a lot of bone, and fusion T11 to uh, S1. And you can see him here, uh, six months passed up, and the patient was so surprised and actually asked me what I actually did. I explained it to him, of course, before, but actually what, what actually did you do? Because he had, uh, could only walk uh, like one kilometer uh, before surgery because of uh, very tired in the back and pain, and now in the uh, sagittal uh, normalized profile, unlimited uh, uh, walking distance. The patient's word was magic. I'm not sure uh, if this would hold out a long time, but at least a very good short time result. And this is the, uh, the x-ray. Here you can see again but actually the thoracic kyphosis is increased, lumbosacral is, is uh, lordosis uh, generated and the global spinal alignment uh, uh, thing is okay. I will not talk about non-compensated imbalance because these are the patients like the picture you saw uh, at, at, the, at the start of the presentation. They are, they are very easy to recognize both clinically and radiographically. It's obvious that you have to do something major to correct the sagittal balance. What I try to do in this talk is to plant something in your brain that even if they look balanced, you have, you have to understand that there is cost for this balance. They compensate by all these mechanisms. And if you can cure them from compensation, they will, they will uh, have a good outcome. That's why C7 plumb line in studies, even if you don't correct the C7 plumb line, it may stay the same. You have a normalized spinal pelvic alignment uh, with uh, no need for compensation. We can show cases, if the uh, chairman wants to, on non-compensated, more like severe imbalance, but I'll leave that to the chairman to decide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hepburn. I think after listening to all these talks, there must be many questions from the audience. We can now 